The damage for constant. By the way, I decided I promised you two more homeworks. I'm only going to give you one because there are a lot of people that haven't turned to some of the previous ones. So I'll let you all get any of you that are broken hearted that you only get seven homeworks and not eight. Come to me, I'll be happy to give you some more kind of fun problems to play with over Christmas or whatever you like. So. Anyway, so I'll, I'll have that one up by the beginning of next week. And let me give you. Uh, a couple of theorems, and I want to give these theorems up without proof because the proofs are going to take uh, longer than what I want to uh, get into. Uh, I still got some more stuff to talk about. Uh, theorem. This will kind of cover about the extent of what we know. Uh, let P and prime. And suppose that G is isomorphic to uh, then. Uh, and, and this is what I meant before. This is exactly the formula for cyclic groups, right? If you consider just the order of the direct sum pieces, right? Because the order of G is N minus one plus one, right? So, for example, if G is isomorphic to Z3 direct sum, Z3 direct sum, Z9 direct sum, Z2187, right? For the Davenport constant of G, is two plus two plus eight plus 21. 86 uh, plus one. And here's kind of the other piece. Twelve point one point eight. Uh, With M by N, then uh, if G is isomorphic to ZM, correct sum ZN, then Davenport constant G is equal to M. Uh, Example. 
Davenport Constance at 330. Uh, Rex on C210 equals um, 239. And notice again, this is spiritually the same kind of theorem because what do you have? You have n minus one plus n minus one plus one, but you get like this, right? And this is what I meant when all the formulas kind of look the same. Um, and I've got to check on this, but um, there exists an uh, example. So this first theorem, th there's also another similarity between these two. Uh, this one is an elementary divisor decomposition with only one prime, right? And Elementary divisor with only one prime means something that works out very nicely for you. Single prime power. This one is an invariant, de uh, invariant factor decomposition where you've got two cyclic groups, right? And that's it, right? So you have two cyclic groups and your invariant factor. So this is one cyclic group and your invariant factor. This is two. They follow the same formula. It's analogous to the one with elementary, with a single prime elementary divisor decomposition. So one would be tempted to say, this is what happens. However, there exists uh, a group of form. The A, or X stands the B, or some C, C Rex on CD with A plus B plus C plus D uh, uh, not uh, follow this. That is to say, more specifically, the Davenport constant in this group is not equal to. Uh, a minus one plus B minus one plus C minus one plus D minus one plus one. The final example I think is more than 96. And actually, that sounds deceptively like, okay, this is something that you can figure out, but I think checking even checking in this group is very, it's very computer time to consume, right? So notice the gap between two and four. In between natural numbers two and four, there is a unique natural number called three. Uh, and that one is unknown, by the way. Um, if it is still unknown, um, I think it is, then that's probably worth a PhD thesis. Uh, however, uh, don't go that route. That would have been very dangerous. Okay, so that this is basically what is known. It's certainly just what I know, which is a subset of what is known. Um, of that before constant this. So, but the that before constant is, so let me, let me kind of shine a light I've tried to do that in the homework. Some of you have asked me some questions about the homework that uh, do connect up with this. Well, which was the reason I did it. So, so far, this is kind of a, a fun combinatorial curiosity for people that have a thing for a billion groups, right? Finite billion groups. So, here is a big connection. What are the identical with uh, your class group five? Um, 
if well here I'm going to talk about this kind of game that we play. Uh, suppose that I find my factor of irreducible and my dedicated domain. Then the ideal generated by alpha. Well, I don't know much, but I know that since this is a dedicated domain, this principal ideal is, in fact, uniquely a product of prime ideals. Right? So this is like P1, P2, step to PM. Uh, what is it, by the way, what is it about uh, irreducible that makes this an interesting principal ideal? Well, no, you, you certainly wouldn't want any of them to be principal, right? Because then it would be reducible. But uh, in general, if you have an irreducible element, then it generates an ideal that is maximal among the set of principal ideals. Not a maximal ideal, but it's maximum on the set of principal ideals. So there's no ideal that contains this properly that is principal, right? So that gets back to what you observed. Um, but alpha is alpha is this, then M. Is less than or equal to the Davenport constant. So that right there is the important observation. Uh, equality is attained if there are infinitely many uh let me remark that that is certainly not an if and only if so uh what I'm saying is um, right. What what, I'm, what what we're saying here is you can attain equality if you have that there's infinitely many ideals. I'm sorry. If you, if you have infinitely many prime ideals in an ideal class, then you attain uh, you can attain equality. This does not mean it's necessary, uh, uh, and in fact. Uh, right, it's it's not it's not necessary. Uh, certainly, for some irreducibles. This gave one each class, and you could repeat that one problem. Yeah, but you might have a different irreducible that's made up of different. So, well, we'll see. Let's look at the proof. Uh, suppose that. Alpha, the ideal term by alpha uh, okay, let's suppose that, that happens. Uh, in the class group, So I'm going to write this as uh, in class group. Uh, the class of P1 plus the class of P2. By the way, this is the class of P1 times P2. I'm going to translate that more clearly. Plus the class of PM is equal to uh, principal class. Uh, Now, so the 
This is the zero sequence. And what else can I observe about the zero sequence? It's a properly zero subsequence. Uh, there's the irreducibility kick in. I'm having proper zero set sequence. Uh, let me clarify that. If if we do reindexing if necessary. Then let's say P1 up to PK now of course this whole thing adds up to zero uh, because that's what we had to start if this is a proper zero subsequence then of course this is in the building group, we've got to balance my equations here. What does that sum to? It also has to sum to zero. And what's the problem with that? This means that P1 of PK is some principal ideal beta, and PK plus one up to PM is some principal ideal gamma. Therefore, the ideal generator by alpha is the ideal generator by beta gamma, which is properly contained at the ideal generator by beta. Therefore, alpha is not irreducible because it is not, it does not generate a max, an ideal that is maximal with respect to the principal. So, what do we have? This is a zero sequence, and it cannot have a proper zero subsequence. And so, up here. Call that for constant of G is the length of the longest. Zero uh, sequence uh, that contains no proper zero subsequence. So uh, M is less than or equal to And there you go. Okay, so let's look at the next statement. The one about the equality holding. Uh, we will suppose, uh, actually, it looks like I proved it in this case. Let me, let me look at this proof here. Uh, assume that there is a prime in every class. I think we'll be able to come back and check that out. Um, now, 
let's choose a zero sequence of length. <clears throat> Uh, with no zero subsequence. Of course, there's you can choose zero subsequence of length k just by choosing the identity uh, k times. But we're going to uh, assume that we have one of these things that has no proper zero subsequence. This must exist because of the fact that uh, the Davenport constant is K, or, well, that's what I say here. So we have class I1 plus class I2 plus class IK is equal to zero and no proper zero subsequence. So Grant, it looks to me like you might uh, choose PI and I spy. And nobody says it has to be different. So uh, certainly that's all we need here. And note uh, that uh, if alpha, the ideal generated by alpha is P1, P2, plus PK, then alpha is irreducible. And so for this alpha, We attain Yes, so we can prove that, haven't we? Yeah, well, proof. I can prove it for one. I, I, I don't know why I did that. So, any questions on that? There's an observation that I'd like to make about this. So, I'm going to talk about elasticity in general, and then we're going to come back to the ring route break right, interest case. But really, this last part of the theorem, notice that there could be irreducibles of much shorter prime ideal factorization length, right? So for example, if you if you have and in fact, if you have a prime ideal in every class, even if the class group is infinite, then if you choose P in the class of I and Q in the class of minus I, which is the class of I inverse. So as long as you can choose one for each of these two classes, you can make alpha and Q. So under very mild hypothesis, you don't even need to find a class group here. If you've got an ideal in every class, then there's always, there's going to be a whole boatload of irreducibles that can be written in this form, right? So this is very short. This right here that we attained in this theorem, in a certain sense, this, this is the biggest irreducibles that you can get, right? In the sense that it's got the longest prime ideal factorization. And that's going to come up in our discussion of elasticity. Any questions? You okay? Uh, how restrictive is it to say that there's a prime ideal in every ideal class? It's like, uh, it's like necessarily there will always be at least some ideal in each ideal class, right? That is correct. So, 
Otherwise, like it wouldn't be the group. So, how, like, how restrictive is it to say there's a fine? Uh, that's a good question. So, it actually, for the kind of natural examples that you might consider, Green's valve break integers, not restricted at all, right? So, like I said, for Green's valve break integers, they're in fact implemented many times in a finite bill device. However, for example, um, let, let, let's explore Eric's question because it, uh, we won't get completely diving deep, but we'll go in a little bit. Uh, suppose, for example, suppose a class group question on space is six. Let me ask you a question. So here are the ideal classes, just for drama's sake. Principal class. Yeah. I make the following. So suppose All the primes could, could, could you have a distribution of primes that are so bad that the only primes occur in the principal class and in the class that two classes four or three? Is that possible? How about all the primes occurring in the class one? Well, so. I'm not going to prove the theorem, so I probably just you shouldn't say, oh, you should look at that. But there's a stopper to this one. Does anybody know what the stopper is? We've got an ideal in the one class. Look at its prime factors. They zero and two <laughs> can't have this for That's right. That's exactly right. So suppose. Okay. No. But pause, suppose I is contained in one class, right? which, as Eric points out, there has to be some ideal in there, otherwise, it wouldn't be quite the group. So there it is. Now, this is a, a, a Dedekind domain. I didn't say that, but I've seen that here. Suppose I is equal to P1, P2, PK. Actually, let me be more dramatic. Q1, uh, QL, where the PIs are in two and the QIs are principal. Right? Then I is in. Uh, well, let's see, what is I in? I is in class zero if what's the condition? And two. So here's the problem. Uh, well, I, actually, can anybody kind of synthesize this example into what problem is here? Two doesn't generate. That's right. It doesn't generate the class group. Right? 
This is not going to provide a stopper, is it? Right? Because if you've got primes in the one class, if all the primes are in the one class, then theoretically you can get everything you want, right? Take an ideal, take an ideal in the two class. Well, it's a product of two primes in the one class, right? Take an ideal in the three class. Take a, and of course, what that would also mean is that uh, the irreducible, what happens if you, if you really could build something like this? What would it what would it say about the irreducible elements in, in the, the range? That's exactly right. They would always have to have exactly six, counting with repetition, possibly, uh, prime ideals in their prime factorization. So there's actually a paper by Chapman and Smith, I believe it is, from the 90s, uh, that talk about Right, you can play games, and actually, to answer your come full circle on your question, constructing these things isn't super hard. But they're not they're not the Dedekind domains that you're going to run to in a number theory class. They, there there are some important theorems about the distribution of prime ideals and what you can do. It, actually, there's a great amount of there are theorems, and actually, in some recent stuff that I've done, I've used this. There's a great amount of freedom. Very, a very great amount of freedom with the way you can deal those cards out. You can deal the primes into the, into the prime ideal classes in the Dedekind domain. So, but in the examples that you see first for Dedekind domains, uh, the cards are dealt pretty easily. And there's infinitely many of them dealt. Okay. Um, this little panic that we're on camera, but I'm going to do it anyway, because that's they are all uh, How many of you have ever heard of the concept of elasticity? What does it sound like to you? <laughs> that's right. It sounds like something you do in an engineering class, right? The elasticity of some thing before, it, you know, the building collapses or whatever. So, elasticity is a, is a kind of a rubber band sort of uh, concept in uh, algebra. So I'll, I'll give you the definition of it. Uh, one. By the way, you can generalize this to non atomic domains as long as you only consider elements that factor into atoms. We define. Uh, actually, uh, we could define the elasticity to be Uh, the supremum of uh, n over n, where r equals alpha 1 to alpha n equals beta 1 to beta n, with alpha i Uh, we define the elasticity of the domain R to be
Okay. So basically what this is, is your, this is the rubber banding part, right? Uh, what you do is you look at all possible factorizations, right? And you look at all possible quotients of long over short. Now, there may be infinitely many factorizations, as we've seen some examples of, and so that's why you take the spring one, right? Uh, there may be no max, there's infinitely many. And of course, uh, Chapman and some of his students have actually uh, constructed these weirdo examples where, you know, you get these real number elasticities and things like this. It's actually quite interesting. Um, so my story about elasticity and naming your terms care for it. Uh, when I was, I may have been an associate professor, but I had just been promoted if I had. Anyway, so I, I did wrote the paper on elasticity and how it related to norms in certain theory frame. And it seemed appropriate, so I sent it to the journal of number theory. Uh, sent it to John Tate. Who's heard of John Tate? Yeah, he was my mathematical grandfather. Yeah, actually wrote a tape. Like tape. Yeah, it, it, there's tape attached to a lot of stuff. Oh, right. right. Tate cohomology group, that, et cetera. <laughs> So I sent it to Tate, and I didn't hear back, and I had other papers in the fire and all this, and it got to be six months. I, I hadn't gotten an acknowledgement. So I wrote, to, and the title of my paper was like Elasticity Property for Preserving the Norm Set or something like this. So I, I wrote to Tate, and I said, you know, uh, you know, and I never heard back any status updates on the paper. Tate wrote back, quite embarrassed. He, he was actually quite nice. Told him something positive. He goes, Oh my God. He goes, I remember that now. He said, I saw the word elasticity in the title. I thought it was a bunch of applied math crap. So I threw it in the garbage. <laughs> 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 so, <anyway. laughs> and he, he was nice enough to uh, get a quick report on the second version. So, anyway. <laughs> so, um, Here's an example, um, and I'm gonna leave this uh, for you to compute. Maybe I'll put this in your final homework set. That might be a good thing. Um, uh, elasticity. Uh, by the way, anybody remember what the class group of condition is? Z example. <laughs> this one's a little bit more challenging. This one actually is six. Uh, it turns out, so I'll let you play around with this. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Not only that, beta is the complex conjugate of alpha because actually this is a norm equation. And it turns out that three and this alpha that you find um, uh, are all derivatives. Notice link 12 here, link 2 here, turns out to be six, right? Um, but really, I, I think that you all could all demonstrate for me um, elasticity. Yeah, so for example, the one we would here, three to the fourth is five plus two radical negative 14, five minus two radical negative 14. So notice four and two. Now, so what this says, of course, is the elasticity of these rings are at least that. Right? Why is it an upper bound? Well, I'm going to get to a theorem with this. Uh, but I want to give one more. Uh, this, this, this appeared in a paper in the 90s, too. Um, and I thought, I thought they had a couple of really nifty examples in there. Here's one for you to play around with. And I'll kind of give you a hint. 
about how to play around with it. Example. This is from a paper uh, by uh, Natalie Gonzalez. Uh, let D be equivalent to one mod four. Uh, Where three and let's let mega equal one plus right. Define A is Z two omega and B is Z omega. Which just for giggles is the same thing as same matter of B. These two are the same ring and B C omega. And consider the domain. XBX. Now, this is one mod four. I'm going to split this down into two subcases mod A. If B is equivalent to five mod A, then um, It is you the elasticity, whatever it is, So if D is equivalent to five mod A, it turns out that you can squeeze the elasticity of, of row R between these two uh, here. Can you get the What's that? That's the order of the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, of course it is. Yep. Um, so minus, right? Uh, If D is equal to one mod A, then elasticity of R is infinity. I mean, that's, that's enough to anger the blood a little bit. Uh, so here's, here's your hint. Uh, consider uh, F. So this is going to be, of course, a polynomial here. X plus X plus omega to the n, uh, and F bar X X plus omega bar. Right. So notice these, of course, are parameterized by n. So Look at these two elements and see what happens. It's I think it's really weird <laughs> that the half the time mod four is tame and the other half of the time it's infinite. By the way, what does it mean for a domain? So the smallest possible elasticity, since you're taking the supremum, the smallest possible elasticity you could ever achieve is one. Right. What does it mean for a domain to have elasticity one? HFP. It's an HFP. That's exactly right. So here is a super groovy tool theorem. Um, So 
of the theorem. So let's uh, let R be a random outbreak integers of class group G. So super specialized. Then the elasticity that would be constant for class group of two and norm G is going to be one. And by the way. Did put this in the same theorem. Let's just count for interest. Let me recall for you that the Davenport constant is less than the order of the class group. So, in other words, if you have a ring of integers in this class, uh, its class number is, you know, 30, that means its elasticity is 15 or less, right? Um, Right. And since I guess all the billion groups of order 30 or if it's billion or 30, I just want to T30 with that. In that case, would that be exactly 15? Um so this is a this is a cool theorem. Um and also it's uh Let me kind of start this. So Yeah, it's probably a little bit long for us to go through. I, I want to go through this proof in detail, and I don't want to. Uh, so let me let me kind of finish this off this way. Uh, uh, if you look at elasticity. Of C joined with negative square root negative 14, then as CL Z square root negative 14 is isomorphic to Z forward, and that important constant C4 is equal to uh, 4, then elasticity. Of this is in fact e. And in fact, what we will see in this proof is the elasticity is a premium, right? We will see in this proof actually that this maximum, this elasticity is, is actually attained uh, by uh, elements that we'll, we'll find in the domain. So if for example, uh, so if you have a ring of algebraic integers that has class group Z2, Z2, notice it says the same class group as this, right? Uh, I'm sorry, not same, same class number as this one does. A different structure proof. The Davenport constant of G, we gave a formula for this, is actually um, three here, right? So, row of 
or in this case, it's three times. So that shows you that elasticity can be different for the same class number, depending on the structure of the group and its data point constant. Uh, cyclic is big, and of course that will obtain a maximum of cyclic. And the uh, two elementary abelian case gives you a slightly smaller elasticity. Okay, questions? All right, think about the math club today, because at least the title thing is going to be kind of interesting. Other than that, you all have a good weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
For the other, the other one, think about this with show. Yeah, or so one direction of the dedication stuff is easier, right? right. Yeah, yeah, I got the one. aesthetic and then so uh, show if is uh, invertible and prime, then uh, is maximal. So that's one lemma. Uh, actually, it's more when you show this is if you have. And these are primes and invertible. Got that one. No, then, then it's unique, right? Yes. Okay, so you've got this one. Now show if P is invertible and prime and P is nice. And my hint here is look at suppose A is in R but not P. Look at PA. You need to, what you want to do to show this the whole way, right? If not, this factors into a bunch of primes, P1, PK, and all these P's contain, say again, all these P's contain P. Now look at PA squared. This is Q1 of QN. Mod out by P and compare these. Uh, mod P, this is just a prime factorization of A, and this is a prime factorization of A squared. That means all these primes are invertible mod p right and so you get uniqueness right so basically what you get is um what you get is mod p you get a is p1 n so a squared is p1 squared of p n squared uh and it's also equal to q1 of q m right now mod p these are the same Right. And so what that means is Q1, Q2 has to be P1 and, and so forth, right? These have to pair off. Now pull it back to the original ring and you get the same thing. Right. And so basically you can uh, play around with some containments here and show that um, uh, what you want is this P is possible. And then after that, you're good to go because since every ideal is a product of primes, right? Suppose, suppose A is in P, right? Now A factors as a product of prime ideals, and P must contain one of the prime ideals, right? But this lemma, if P is invertible and prime, then it's maximal. So P1 is maximal, so P and P1 are the same. And so what you've now shown is any prime is involved in a factorization of a principle, therefore it's invertible. That's really fast and loose. So yeah, let me know that. Take a picture. Absolutely. Yeah, I was trying to. I thought maybe I could use the characterization from one, and I show that. Okay, if I if I have a, um, if I assume that everything can be written as a product of primes, then. It has to be unique, and then I can just apply it. that. That sure the cancellation holds, so it's almost like I kind of had to find another way to show it's also the theorem. But and there are so what I outlined for you is the way that I saw to do this. There's something like 50 characterizations of dedicated domains in the literature, uh, and what that means is 